Amen. That's true. That's what it's about. I was reading somewhere today a thought that somebody said, you know, we, and I alluded to that this morning, that we often talk about, and right, rightly we should, God's love for us, His fervent love for us. But if that's where it ends, it makes it sound like it's all about us. And when you, and when you turn this thing from God's love to us to our love to Him, it goes back to Him. And that's where, that's where it should be headed. All the attention goes back to Him. And that's kind of in line with what Steve was just expressing in prayer. I begin reading in Philippians again tonight just as a summary expression of the doctrine of sanctification. And we'll kind of summarize a few thoughts that I tried to press home last time and and we'll just go through this at whatever pace we go through it. And, and when it looks like I've gone long enough, I'll stop. How's that? And we'll pick it up uh, the next time. Is that all right? In other words, normally the way I put a message together is I have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. And it's all worked out real well. I don't know about how nicely it is, but it's worked out anyway. Uh, I, I, don't, I have not worked out a conclusion tonight. So it's going to conclude how the clock's going to uh, guide me. But I want... I want us to go through it. This is kind of a teaching slash preaching time, and I want us to understand this doctrine. It's very critical. How critical is the doctrine of sanctification? Without it, you ain't going to heaven. That's how, that's how critical it is. And so it is, it is a vital doctrine of Scripture. Uh, and... So we want to understand what, what is, you know, I just made that statement, and some of you are probably nervous, like, oh, no. Well, what does it mean that sanctification is working in us? And so we want to be clear on that. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only. And Paul, again, is writing to believers, just as he is in the Roman letter. He is in the Philippian letter. He's writing to saints. He's already said, being confident of this one thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. So he's not writing to these Philippian saints with some sort of question mark over their salvation. He seems to be pretty confident of what God has done and is doing in them. And so whatever the verses we're about to read are saying, Paul isn't saying to them, I doubt that you're really saved. Or I'm afraid that you're not saved. That's not what he's saying. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There are a couple of other times that expression fear and trembling are found in Scripture. One is in Ephesians 6, 5 in relationship to servants to masters. They're to obey in fear and trembling. And the other time, I'm forgetting exactly where that is right now, uh, but it is uh, that combination, those combination of words are used in another place as well. And there is this idea of, of reverence, of, of a sort of, um, it, really the Apostle Paul is, seems to be anyway, striking at this idea of living with presumption. In other words, this is something you must continually work out. It's not something, it's not a one and done. It's not, I believe back in 19 whatever, and I'm just coasting now. No, if you, if you believed here, you're believing here, and you're believing here, and you're believing here, and you're continuing to work this salvation out. That's a responsibility that we have. And there is no tension in Scripture on this. The tension is in us. Sometimes you say, well, that sounds like work salvation. It's not a work salvation. It's a salvation that works. There's a work in salvation. And the Scriptures are clear on that. And then he says in verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you. And if it's not God working in you, then it's, it's simply you working. And if it's simply you working, the best that you're going to be is a Pharisee. The best you're going to be is a self-righteous sinner. But if God is working in you, then, then the, the works that are coming forth, the desire that's coming forth, are, are going to be those which are pleasing to the Lord. And that's uh, part of the idea of our being married to Christ and bringing forth fruit unto God, which Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. 
For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And then he launches off into a couple of, of specifics in this area of sanctification. Do all things without murmurings and disputings and so forth. Sanctification we have seen as God's work. We know that. The scriptures clearly teach that. We spent time last week looking at it. It is God's work in the sinner. And you know what the goal of sanctification is? Sinless perfection. The goal of sanctification is your sinless perfection. Let me ask you this. Should you be aiming for sinless perfection right now? Why wouldn't you be? Do you love your sin? Do you want to sin? Are you a servant to uncleanness unto uncleanness? Has nothing changed in your life? You, you understand that if, if, if it's an irritation to you to be pressed toward righteousness, if it's an irritation to you to be pressed toward holiness, You've got a heart level problem. There's an issue. You may not have ever died to sin, according to Romans chapter 6. But if you've died to sin and you're dead to sin because you died to sin, then there's been a different relationship in your life to sin, the law, and death. You have a relationship with Christ in his death and resurrection. And there's a practical effect upon your life. So when you sing that song, or when you hear Romans 6, Paul say in Romans 6, yield not, but yield. And when you hear the multitude of exhortations in Scripture that are similar to that, your spirit, that new creation in you, says, yeah, that's what I want. But there's still that flesh which causes trouble. And so sanctification is necessary in 1 John 3. I said that sinless perfection is the goal. We're going to look at some errors, errant views of sanctification, uh, Lord willing, in, in um, the next time we talk about sanctification. I'm not sure exactly when that's going to be. But 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. So this is the relationship. We've been born again. We have been adopted into the family of God. On both accounts, we are children of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So when are you going to be, remember the goal, we're being, it's been predestinated that you be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's an ongoing thing right now. When will you achieve that perfection, that sinless perfection to be like Christ? When will that be achieved? When you see him as he is. And when will that be? Yeah, it won't just simply be when you die. Some people say, well, when I die, I'll be sinlessly perfect. No, you won't be sinlessly perfect when you die. You'll be sinlessly perfect when you see Him. And when you see Him, it's not just a visible, I mean, eye shot of Him. It's when you see Him, when you have a full perception of Jesus Christ. Everything that is, that is still a remnant of your corruption will be will be flushed out of you. Your mind will be full of Jesus Christ. And to the degree that your mind is, when the mind of Christ is upon you right now and in you right now, to that degree you are experiencing a walk of sinlessness. Back in Philippians chapter 2, your, the preceding verses to, it is God that works in you. Let this, verse 5, chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And I'm not going to re-preach it, but you can listen to Jim Gable's message from the conference of this last week, and he goes into some very insightful thoughts about, about what this is about. And the primary thing that the kingdom of God is characterized by is 
Humility and service. Humility and servitude. And I would encourage you to listen to the message. You have to, one of those you have to hang with, because Jim Gables is not, he's not a surface preacher, but, but there's, some, there's, some, there's some meat there that will feed you. I, don't, I think the message is in a line. If it's not, you can find it from, his, uh, from, from the Sermon Audio's messages that he has uploaded himself. So sinless perfection is the goal. Already we are holy. Already we are saints in Christ. We looked at that last week. And so the, our sinless perfection is not what qualifies us for, for being called a holy one, a saint. What qualifies us to be called a saint or a holy one is being in Christ. And so we have been set apart by the Father, by the Spirit, in Christ... And on that basis, we are called saints. And then we are becoming holy. That is, in the practical sense, like Christ, which will be perfected when we see him, according to 1 John 3. By the way, I didn't read the third, the third verse. You see what that says. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So there's an effect upon your life right now as you live with this hope of sinless perfection, when you see Him, that hope has a purifying effect upon us. And we have other scriptures which would confirm that thought as well. We'll not turn to those, but they exist. So a believer desires to be holy. I'm not going to belabor that point, but it seems clear from Romans chapter 6 that that is the the, the shift, I've called it a, a change in orientation, or we might say a change of relationship uh, in Christ, with Christ. And so that, that moves us away from the former relationship we had with sin, the former relationship we had with the law. If we were uh, of a religious persuasion and were seeking to follow the law for our righteousness, and yet still under the condemnation of that law. But Christ is the one who, who delivers us from that relationship. So that now we, we are living under the relationship to God of grace. Which changes everything for us. And it doesn't liberate us to sin. It doesn't even liberate us to, de to desire to sin. It's just the opposite. We are no longer under the dominion of sin. We are not under law, which I take that to be the condemnation of the law. But we're under grace. And the reason I take it to mean that is because the very next verse in verse 15, the question asked is, shall we sin because we are not under the law? If Paul meant we're not under, if, if by un, not being under the law, Paul meant that we had no laws to follow as God's children, that would have been a superfluous question. There'd be no sin, for without the law, there's no sin. So surely he means the condemnation of the law. We're not under the law in that sense, but we're under grace. And of course, we know that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live God soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And then in Romans 6, 16 to the end of the chapter, really Paul fleshes out this, this change that has taken place, this change of relationship. We're no longer servants to what we were once servants to. We've been liberated. We've been liberated from the dominion of sin. We've been liberated from the dominion of the law. We've been liberated from the, the dominion of death. And all of that is because of our, our relationship to Jesus Christ, which is what he has expounded upon in the first ten verses of Romans chapter 6. That's kind of a summary of, of the last Sunday evening. I want us to think tonight, we... we we pressed this thought last week that God is the one who initiates sanctification. In other words, apart from God, there would be no sanctification. Apart from God, all you would have is moralism. You might be a Pharisee. You might be a clean living person. Um, but you would not be experiencing sanctification. 
Sanctification is God's work. It's what He is doing. And it is really a separation of ourselves into a relationship to Him. And there is evidence of that in our lives. It works its way out practically. And so I think another expression, God initiates sanctification, but I, I've used this expression, God also implements sanctification. He initiates, but He implements. In, in other words, God is doing something in us. And there are four headings here that I want to throw at you tonight, and I really do want to present all four just in one package here, so I'll try to try to keep my ex, uh, extemporaneous thoughts to a minimum here and, and try to press these four headings home to you. They are, sanctification can be viewed this way. It is a definitive work of God. It is a practical work. It is a progressive work. And it is a perpetual work. And it is a work that we are responding to. We are participating in. And we'll see that. It is a definitive work. It involves the personal invasion of God into the rebel sinner's life. In other words, this really is regeneration. And this is where sanctification begins. We're going to see an errant view the next time. There are those who believe that sanctification is a separate blessing or work of grace, as they call it. Sanctification begins with regeneration. That's when you receive eternal life. And when eternal life is imparted to you, <laughs> everything changes. And everything begins to change. Everything changes and everything begins to change. And then everything continues to change. This is the quickening or the creative work of God in the dead sinner's soul. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 2. Again, he's writing to saints, those who are already called saints. And he's reviewing, this is what happened to you. You were once dead in trespasses and sins. Once you walked according to the course of this world. You were in the flow of this world. Good or bad. Moral or immoral. Whatever world you happen to be flowing in, it was not a world that had a relationship with God. You were without God in this world. You were separated from God in this world. You were walking according to the prince of the power of the air. Maybe deceived in your own self-righteousness. Maybe comfortable in who you are. Maybe comfortable in the peace that you had made with God. Or whatever it may be. Or maybe a profligate, immoral, horrible person. That even the a large segment of the world couldn't put up with. But either case, uh, you were walking according to the prince of the power of the air, separated from God, dead in trespasses and sin. The, 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 in, you were walking according to the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. And Paul includes himself, and that's interesting that he includes himself because you know Paul's testimony. Concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. Paul lived an upstanding life. Pa Paul, was, Paul was not a drunkard. He wasn't a, 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 a womanizer. Uh, he was a person that had lived a, what folks would say, a, a righteous life as they viewed him. He was religious. He served God in his mind. And yet he says here, among whom also we all had our conversation, our manner of life in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, 
Do you understand if this describes you now, if you're an individual that's living your life simply to fulfill the desires of your flesh and of your mind, you understand you're not born again. You're dead in trespasses and sin. That, that, that's what he says. See, this, if that characterizes your life, and we're by nature the children of wrath even as others, well, what happened? But God, that's what happened. God stepped in. God intervened. God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened He's made us alive. That's, that's the word we understand when we think of regeneration, being born again. That's the word quickened. By the way, just a note to you, when you read of the word quicken in the Psalms, it's not, I would say most of the time, it's not the same as what we find here in the epistles. Uh, it is more of a reviving, a refreshing of the soul than it is a, an awakening from spiritual death. But here, it is the enlivening of the dead soul, dead in trespasses and sin. He has quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you're saved. And then he talks about grace. And that's where a lot of people, you know, they get to that point. And a lot of Baptists, you know, were saved by grace. Once saved, always saved. And that's the end of the story. But that is not the end of the salvation story. Salvation is by grace. It will always be by grace. Nothing but grace. Through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. It's not of works. If that were true, for sure, as sure as we're sitting here, we'd be boasting. We'd be, we'd be looking down our nose at other people. We'd be lifting our heads high and how great we are and how rotten everybody else is. Uh, we wouldn't be weeping over anybody that's out of line. We'd be spitting at them and saying, why haven't you gotten right with God? You know, we would be arrogant. If we don't understand, this, this whole salvation is of grace. But notice, he says, not of works lest any man should boast. He doesn't stop there. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. There is a creative work of God. When we are saved by grace, we are recipients of a... New creation, work of God. We are, the Bible calls it a, a new man. We're no longer, we're no longer characterized by the old man. We're characterized by a new man. We're different. The reigning power of sin is broken. I'm saying this is a definitive act, a definitive work. God has done something in us. While sin is still a formidable enemy, it's blinding, controlling, power is broken. And you know what's alive and well in us? Repentance. And when sin is made real to us, we don't have, we don't have the same desire with our former lusts and desires. They've, they've been crucified. Something has happened. Something has changed. And when we become sensitive by the reading of the Word or under the preaching of the Word, when the, the, the Holy Spirit shines His convicting light upon us, when we're made aware of sin, it, 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 it grieves us. We, we, depending on what it is and the degree of it, we weep and maybe weep bitterly. But we don't continue in it. There's repentance. How far can a person go following sin, not experiencing this work of sanctification? How far can they go away from God and still enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, I'm going to tell you something. It's a dangerous thing to try to answer that question. I would say to you, don't look at it that way. I would say to you, take the warnings of Scripture seriously. 
And anyone that's characterized by any sinful departure from God, whatever it is, the Bible says they will not inherit the kingdom of, of heaven. So how do I know? If I'm really one in whom the Spirit of Christ is at work, how do I know if I'm one that's been given this life? Well, I ask you, is there repentance in you? Do you come to a point where you say, I can't keep going this direction. I can't do this anymore. I've got to get back to Christ. Christ. You see, that's repentance right there. And faith, which is that repentance and faith is not a one and done thing for the child of God. It is a continual work in our lives. And so there is this definitive work which, is, which takes place at the beginning of our Christian life that leads necessarily to practical effects because there is a reorienting of a flesh-driven life to one that is led by the Spirit through the Word. So that's first. There's this definitive work. And maybe spend a little less time on this. It's a practical work. Because we've already kind of hinted at it, right? It's a practical work. This is the... We talk about practical sanctification. Did you know that there are some people who's, who do not believe? There are some who say they're believers who say... There is no such thing as practical sanctification. So that it has been said like this, and I heard Jim Gable say this, that somebody actually preached this, that David was as pleasing to God when he was lying in the arms of Bathsheba as any other time in his life. Because... He's sanctified already. And whether he was committing adultery or not had nothing to do with his sanctification. Brother, that's a bold-faced lie out of hell. Do not believe that. There are those in sovereign grace circles who preach that kind of garbage. No, you can displease your Father in heaven. And you are not pleasing to him. In fact, the scripture says that, that David did, it actually says that, he did not please the Lord. I don't know why they don't read that far when they make those kinds of comments. But if the Spirit of Christ is in you, Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 14, there is a practical effect. There are fruits being born in your life. You cannot be married to Jesus Christ and not bring forth fruit unto God. You cannot. Romans 7 and verse 4. It is a necessity of being joined to Jesus Christ. You will bring forth fruit unto God. In Romans 8 and verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh. You know, if you're in the flesh, you can't please God. If your life is characterized by flesh, you cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. You can't get... Language cannot be more plain than that. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. We still... I think that's talking about this mortal body. We still are going through the corruption, the mortality of this body because of sin. But the Spirit is life. So the outer man is dying, the inner man is, is thriving. And the outer man is going to be redeemed eventually. That's the redemption of this body that, is, that Paul talks about in Romans 8 that is part of the hope that we have in Christ. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. A very simple question. Are you being led of the Spirit of God? 
Are you just doing whatever your flesh prompts you to do? Do you wake up every day and live every day with whatever you feel like doing for that day? You say, well, it's nothing grossly sinful. I didn't ask you that. If you are being living your life simply by the motivation of your flesh, you're not living in the Spirit. You're not walking in the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Do you hear the practical nature of this sanctification? It's something that works its way out in our lives. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, inner and outer, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness. There's, this, is a, this is a practical thing that we must apply ourselves to. And it's the result of what God has done and is doing in us. Thomas Watson describes sanctification as a flower. He says, weeds grow wildly and naturally. Flowers must be planted. When I said this up in Oklahoma, it came from, because on our way up there, we passed fields of wild flowers. And so... Um, Thomas Watson obviously didn't live somewhere where there were lots of wild flowers. You don't have to plant wild. He's talking about a flower garden here when he makes this statement. And in a flower garden, you ever notice you get it all cleaned up and you plant your flowers and it looks so good. I've done this in some little pots in my side of my house. And I, you know, I've got it, the ground is so brown around it and this flower, and there's these little red things, and it looks so pretty, and a few days go by, and all of a sudden there's these green things growing up everywhere around it. I don't even know what they are. Actually, they look pretty good, so I've left them. Oh, actually, I'm lazy. But no, I, you know that, but weeds, you don't, you don't have to plant weeds, do you? Johnny Erickson Tata, in something we were listening to, she calls them sprouts. It doesn't take long for sin to sprout if we're not attentive. Sanctification, Watson says, is the flower of the Spirit's planting. This is how we know that we've been born again of the Spirit of God. And this is one of the reasons why I call sanctification a gift of God. It is connected to the assurance of our salvation. It is a work that He's doing in us. It's not, you say, well, I've been born again. Well, how do you know? I'm saved. How do you know? Well, this is how you know. Sanctification. It's a gift of God. It's not just God pounding you over the head with the tables of stone and saying, get it right, buddy, get it right, buddy. It's a blessing. Sanctification is a blessing. You ever looked at it that way? A gift. Our hearts are assured as we see fruit coming forth from our lives. Flowers and fruit. That's of God's planting. He produces within us a will and the power to do what pleases Him. The fruits of this planting of the Spirit are the evidences of sanctification. A heart that has been sanctified by the Spirit will bear fruits of sanctification which are many and varied. All these fruits are simply characteristics of the nature of a holy God implanted within the soul, coming forth in the experience of every justified and sanctified believer. So there's this practical side of sanctification, the work going on in us. It is progressive. It is definitive, it's practical, it's progressive. This is clear from Scripture. The exhortations and imperatives of the New Testament clearly demonstrate the ongoing nature of sanctification. Paul writes to Peter as well. When they write their letters, they're using language which makes it clear that this thing is not finished yet. This thing, it's a continuing work. Romans 12 and verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the, not by the already renewed mind, but the renewing of your mind. 
It's an ongoing activity that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there's going to be evidences of change in our lives. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You, you hear this is God at work, but we're... we're we're cooperating. Some folks don't like to hear the word cooperation with God, but it's not a bad term. Our response of faith to the Spirit and the Word affects our progress. One of the reasons why there are some that are more advanced than others lies at this point right here. It is the response of faith. But of course also God is at work at different Levels, um, different ways, um, and that's God's business. God doesn't work in all of us in the same way, to the same degree, to the same extent, for the, for the very same purpose. I mean, generally speaking, yes, but not specifically. And so there is this progressive, practical, putting off, of the details of the old man, that old garment. It's, that's the picture, the wording that Paul uses in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 is, is taking that off. It, it, they're, they're rags. We, don't know, we no longer want to wear those old rags that are associated with, with who we were before we were born again. One of the things that I, I don't understand in a lot of people's lives who profess to be Christians, they seem to be very comfortable in an environment where there is the... It's not just simply being in an, envir an environment where there are ungodly people and ungodly things going on, but in an environment where you are actually engaging with them with some measure of delight in what you're hearing coming from the stage or on the screen, something's not right there. Something's out of, out of line. I mean, I could go down to a fiesta this week, I think. I don't know that I could. I think I could. Maybe I couldn't. Do I sound real sure of myself there? I think I could go down there and find probably some things that I could enter into with some measure of enjoyment, perhaps. But I would assume that my spirit would be vexed. Would it, John? <laughs> my spirit would be vexed when I would be seeing the things that I would be forced to see. I, I choose to stay away uh, unless there's some ministry effort. And brethren, this is not, I'm not saying what I'm saying in an attempt to control your lives. I'm just saying this is the, this is, this is sanctification. Is it working in your life? And I'll add this. When I was in my early 20s, I wasn't what I am in my mid 50s. Does that help some of you guys out? And I don't say that to cause you to be satisfied where you are if you need to be somewhere else. I'm just saying, this has been a progressive work in my life. Sanctification. I should be further along than some of you are. Is that true? Y'all are staring at me like, uh, I don't know about that. Is that true? Shouldn't I be further along than some of you are? But what I'm saying is, are you further along today than you were a year ago? Two years ago, three years ago, is there a progression? Are you putting off and putting on the characteristics of the new man, putting off the characteristics of the old man, putting on the characteristics of the new man? That's not an immediate thing. It's not a, an instantaneous 
mature thing. Sanctification in this sense is ever increasing as we are formed more and more into the image of Christ. But it happens. It must happen. And if it doesn't happen, something's desperately wrong. For this is a characteristic of God's children. I'm going to save Hebrews 12 for another time. But you can read it in Hebrews 12, 5 through 14. We quote the verse that says, Without holiness no man shall see the Lord. That word holiness there is the word sanctification. Without sanctification no man shall see the Lord. Some people say, well, that's positional. It's not positional, it's practical. And how do I know that? Read from verse 5 on. That's what he's talking about. So there is this work that's going on. It doesn't mean that you have achieved a certain level of sanctification. It means that it's happening. It's working in you. Sanctification. It's progressive. It's definitive. It's God's work. Something changes. The day you truly believe, nothing will ever be the same for you. There's going to be this practical impact upon your life. There's going to be this progressive change in your life. Uh, some of us know that. You look back, there are things that once upon a time I would have been comfortable with that I'm not comfortable with anymore. Is that true for you? Have you found that to be the case? There are things that, that used to maybe characterize certain areas of my life that I wasn't even aware of, having been made aware of it, has grieved me. And I've sought God for change in those areas of my life. And I'm not, just, I'm not just talking about the things we often like to throw our darts at. You know, drinking, smoking, drugs, illicit sex, etc. I mean, those are the things. If you don't know those things are, are wrong, I, I'm not sure what I can say to you that will change your mind. But I'm talking about those, those graces, those fruits that the Holy Spirit produces. Love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. God produced more of that in me. Right? That's the Spirit's work. That's not something I can do. He must do it. And then it works out. I do it as He does it. He gives it. That's sanctification. Definitive, practical, progressive, and finally perpetual. Sanctification is a perpetual work. I threw this in. I don't know if anybody else has used this word. Probably have. I just, I didn't read it anywhere. But it, it just makes sense to me that we add this dimension to sanctification for this reason. Danger is always lurking. And so sanctification is a perpetual work. In other words, you never get to the place where you quit being participating in this work of sanctification, there will, there will be the need to continually mortify remaining uprisings of sin. Even when you have... I remember Jim Gables one time preaching. His name's come up a lot tonight. But years ago, he preached a message at Bible Baptist. And he said, he was kind of an open confession time in the pulpit. He says, brethren, he said, there are some things in my life that I thought I was done with only to find out in recent years they've crept back up. Y'all need to take that seriously. Lest you be overtaken by that which you think has already been dealt the blow that it needs to be dealt with. That Paul talks about it in Hebrews 12. The sin which does so easily beset you. I call it our Achilles heel. And all of us have it. Whatever it is for you. That thing that has just nipped at your heels all your life. You may come to a place in your life where I'm delivered from that. No, you're not delivered from anything until you get to heaven. You must constantly be mortifying. You must constantly be aware. Sanctification is a perpetual activity. Activity. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. May I remind you again tonight, as I've reminded you before, the flesh is always the flesh. 
The flesh will never be anything but the flesh. And as long as you're in this world, you're living in the flesh. You cannot, you must not make provision for the, well, I'm, I'm a spiritual man now. I'm a new creature in Christ. I can, I can go anywhere. I can do anything. I can engage with anybody. And I, I have power over it all. That kind of attitude is going to get you in trouble. Paul says, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We sang it tonight in, in Romans 6 and verse 12. He's talking to regenerate people. He's talking to people who have died to sin. And he says to them, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust. It's still there. This is what frustrates me about people who seem to present a kind of salvation in which there, is no, there, there are no lusts. If you have lust, then you're not born again. That's not true. You've got to fight. The, you are now equipped to fight those lusts. To win over those lusts. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. You can obey that. Because you've died in Christ. To sin, to the law, to death. You have a different relationship. And now you... You have a relationship with righteousness that you didn't have before. But yield yourselves unto God. Listen to this. As those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Some people say you need to get out of Romans 7 and into Romans 8. Once you get out of Romans 7 and into Romans 8, there's victory. I don't, that language just is not helpful. I come to Romans chapter 8 and I, I read these words. Mortify the deeds of the body. That's in Romans chapter 8. The battle is not over in Romans chapter 8. It's just simply you are equipped to win the battle. You have the the, the law, the principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and you've been made free from the law or the principle of sin and death so that you now can overcome the flesh. And you can please God. But that's going to require the perpetual activity of mortification. Uh, theologians use two words. I think John Owen... I don't know if he's the one that put these words down, but there are two aspects to I'm being careful here because I think I'm thinking sanctification or regeneration. But there are two words, and they are to the life of the Christian, let me put it that way. Vivification and mortification. Vivification means life. It's the positive side. It's the life of Christ in you. Mortification is the negative side. That's the fight. And you'll, and you'll never be done with either one of those. The only, way, the only way that you'll be successful in mortification is if you've experienced vivification, the life of Christ in you. Two, go together. Well, what is your responsibility? How are you going to win? I mean, if my battle is just with you, William, I might be successful, maybe. Okay? There's a problem. Our battle really isn't with flesh and blood, is it? My battle's not with you. My battle's not with Jody. Your battle's not with your husband or your wife. Or your children. Or your co-worker. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We like to... We like to think of that's the face of it. That's, so that's where we put our, we pour our energy. So we hate on one another. We, we bludgeon one another. We bite and devour one another. And all the while, the unseen forces of evil, we got them. We got them. They don't see us. All they see is each other. But we must put on the whole armor of God. See, that's our responsibility in sanctification. 
putting on. It's perpetual. It's not I put it on and I'm, you know, I'm clothed and it's over with. It's, it's I'm putting it on. It is a daily activity. I remember when I was going through, and I'm done here, almost. And I remember when I was going through, uh, it would be hard for me to even describe it in a way that would that would reveal the intensity of the battle that I was enduring in 2009 to 2011. There were, there were nights I would wake up every... I didn't even want to go to bed at night because I knew I was going to wake up with this battle. And it was in the middle of the night. It was a spiritual warfare, the likes of which I don't ever want to... I, I, I've read Pilgrim's Progress, parts of it, and I've read about the battle in Pilgrim's Progress and with Apollyon, and that's the way it felt. And I'll tell you, it felt to me like Apollyon was winning. And I asked, uh, I asked Jeff Pollard, uh, he was one of my counselors during that time, and, you know, Jeff, I, I think I'm going to die. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to live. I don't know how I'm going to, you know, I don't, I, I was, it was horrific. And he told me, he said, every night, dwell on Ephesians 6, 11 through 13, every night. Fill your mind with Ephesians 11, uh, 6. 6, 11 through 13, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And then all of the armament, pieces of the armament. And I did that. I took that passage and I just mulled over it and I meditated on it. And I tried to fill my mind with it. I suppose to some degree it was helpful. I surely didn't know what else to do. But I would say to you that that's part of the perpetual battle that we face. Sometimes it's more intense than others. But our responsibility is to fight. Our fight, our fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil is real. And there is the attempt to stir up remaining sin. There is, you know what Satan is trying to do? He is trying to get you to apostatize. Believer, he's not done with you. You say, you know, why, why would he keep hounding you? Why, why would he keep up trying to get to you? Why would, if you're saved, you know, it's done, I'm saved. Do you understand? There is a battle going on. And you know what Satan is? Satan is not really after you. He doesn't really care about you at all. But he cares about the glory of God. And he is trying to mar the glory of God. And when you think of it that way, if that doesn't stir you up to fight, I don't know what will. It tells me that you have a low view of God. But if you have a view of the glory of God and your concern is you do not want God, you, you want even as we saw this morning, even your death to glorify God. If your heart and soul is about the glory of God, then you do not want to walk into the traps of the devil to seek to bring dishonor to God. But if he can get a true believer to apostatize, then the covenant of God is destroyed. The covenant of the Father and the Son is destroyed. Now that won't happen because God is God and Satan is not God's equal. And Christ has died and He is victorious and He is our hope. But I'm trying to just kind of shed a little light on why there is this perpetual warfare. Why, why is Satan, why does he still, you know, read Revelation 12, the warfare that's going on. Well, let's not stop fighting. I like W.R. Downing uses the expression gospel sanctification. I think I said that last week. Let me just close reading this to you. Gospel sanctification is at once a position 
or relationship, we're in Christ. But it is also a definitive act. Christ is in us. And it is also a practical, progressive, and perpetual state. This is sanctification. Listen, brethren, you cannot... You cannot focus on one aspect to the, to the exclusion of the others. You will become imbalanced. You must understand this is the full picture of sanctification in Scripture. You've got to lay hold of it all. If you don't, you're going to be led into some error and perhaps heresy. And the Lord willing will look at some of those errant views and imbalances beginning in the next message on sanctification. I hope this is helpful. If there are questions that you have, I, I ask you again to, to write. If there's scriptures, you know, I, I know over in the prison, always, always, always. What about 1 John 3? And, you know, we'll, we'll probably get to that at some point, just answer that. 1 John 3. Um, which kind of sounds like sinless perfection in this life, if you're familiar with 1 John 3. And so that's always want to know about that, because there's this battle in the faith-based dorm room over this very issue of sanctification. And uh, we need to be clear on it. It is a battle. There is a lot of confusion. So I hope this has been helpful tonight to look at these things. Let's stand together. Close in prayer. Discuss these matters. Go to the scriptures together. If you come up with questions, come to me with them and you can talk to me about them. You can send me.